This was an important site, uh, archaeologically speaking. I mean, people from the people from way back into the Archaic period were here, seven thousand years BC. My goodness, and then followed by the Fremont. So peoples peoples have come and gone through here. the Goshut people, the Paiute, I don't know just who they were down in here. They'd been living here for generations and they they knew the they knew the seasons. They knew any given season what would what would be available to eat and where certain kind of seeds, a certain kind of plant. Maybe, uh, maybe when the rabbits came out of their holes, they, they knew, and so they they traveled through, they moved through this through this country, through this great basin land here. And one day they one day they came around one of these ridges, one of these mountains, and there were those. There were those strange white Mormon settlers with their horses and their cattle trampling all over their seeding grounds, taking possession of, the, of their springs. Now what do they do? remnant of them has still been preserved. I, I think God must have loved the life these people were leading. He preserved it for them for so long and they still have posterity here. Such a short time the Euros have been here. Such a short time. Well, I'm going to read several poems from my volume, which I think of as my final volume, probably my collected poems titled Into the Sun, Poems Revised, Rearranged, and New. This is from a, I'm going to read three from a group called, titled Ars Poetica. Seemed like a good place to start. So from that group, number four, a burgundy Porsche, it is warm chocolate, wraps itself mindlessly around a lamppost, incites it to flash neon poems. This occurs with some frequency in the gardens of temples that hide in the depths of canyons, in shadows behind boulders, beside springs around which deer and lions and many smaller creatures congregate to consider the meaning of what is etched on the walls. The woman who walks the canyons, sometimes she is old, sometimes she is young, sometimes she is naked, sometimes she is clothed, sometimes pauses to interpret, but the animals never think to write her words. It could be done with a tip of an antler or a claw and a small offering of blood. It is rumored that they are written on light behind the pages of old books, and sometimes the pages are thin enough to reveal them. They may also be enciphered by flashing street lamps and the drippings of melting Porsches. Number five from the same group. Yesterday a stone 
spoke of dried up seas and stunted grass. In obedience to rules of prosody laid down by trout that flash in sunlight. They remember solemnly the girls who dance in woods. The girls' eyes are large and wide. They are not fooled by foolish men who lose their shoes when passing through a room, who cling by the fingernails to the surface of the smooth sphere that rises from the lake, from beneath the roots of water lilies afloat in the night. Forget me not, the night says, as it slips behind the moon to rest and heal. Its wounds gape and are very painful. It is wounded mysteriously every time it walks in the empty streets where battle tanks and kelp groves once reigned over a populace of poets and metaphysicians who scratched futilely at the faces of tall buildings trying to catch hold. Number six, a raven said, unto what shall I liken these mysteries that you may understand? Behold, who has seen them has seen rain fly up from the earth. Behold, he has seen it. Nevertheless, the stones creep beneath the garden, forgetful of rain and violets. The violets peer about expectantly, but the stones forget to embrace them. Even so, rain flies up from the earth, iron butterflies cavort in sunshine. Therefore shall the violets remember that they have seen fire, have seen rain, that the river of lies that flows down from that lost star that runs beneath the balconies of a spacious building the dreams that stumble into it can remember yet their innocence. Otherwise, the violets must forsake all hope of marriage. Behold, may these things not be likened unto the sayings of that woman who lives in deep woods, she who is sometimes old, sometimes young, who sometimes goes clothed, sometimes naked. She sends out dreams to twelve dreamers, to one a white rabbit, to another an ambassadress of saltpeter, to another an iron butterfly, and so on unto all the twelve, unto each in his time, unto each according to the word that comes to her from the night that lives behind the rock. Each inscribes his dream in the patina of a canyon wall, each ponders his inscription. Each reaches forth to touch the fire that lives behind it, behind the rock, behind the night, where stones lie with violets. And here's this last little couplet. It's number seven in that group, and I rather like it. Touch a word, and a whole language trembles in anticipation. The couple in the cherry tree, lips and tongues. This one is titled Looking Down a Narrow Valley. Looking down a narrow valley where a river runs straight, both sides heavily wooded with fir and spruce, a notch of clear sky in the distance where the river drops over the horizon. Hanging in the notch against the blue sky, an enormous boulder of weathered limestone, carved with letters of a language I do not know. They are scripture of a vanished race. I touch the carvings with my fingertips, tiny grooves. A long step from the top of the boulder to the left ridge of the canyon but the air among the trees is sweet, the odor of fir and spruce needles warmed by the sun. The vision of the unknown alphabet is clear in the memory as I sit cross-legged in the mouth of a cave behind me in hooded robes, some of blue and some of red, are the members of a band of itinerant scholars. 
but perhaps they are workmen or jugglers. They are very small. Letters of the unknown alphabet scratched into the walls of the cave, on the ceiling and the walls, and a drawing of an unknown animal, an animal with long legs and a hornless head. It speaks slowly, but its words cannot be made out. The girls who attend it are gowned in diaphanous gauze that would catch fire if exposed to the sun. One of them points at letters on the wall and gazes back expectantly as if waiting for a response. But in the distance, the river flashing in code demands attention. The small men in red and blue are dispersed among the trees. Birches have grown up among the firs. Smooth pebbles exude from small holes in the bark and slide in orderly streams down the trunks. Pebbles, red and blue, a letter carved on each of them. The boulder fragments as if from within. The pieces move apart slowly. Blue sky appears between them. They cease to move. The cluster holds its position. The girls approach from behind, careful to remain in shade. The key to the unknown language is kept in a box at the back of the cave. One of the girls sits on it. The other moves a finger on the wall, writing. Thank you. I have two more marked out here. This one is dedicated to the uh, French poet Gérard de Nerval. We should talk, bon Gérard. We should sit at a café table at the bottom of a sandstone cliff, beyond the tamarisk that infests the riverbank. We should drink new cider and ponder over the glyphs incised in the stone. We should find arrowheads in the sand and lay them out on the table and speak of them. We should make a sonnet of the glyphs. We should inscribe the sonnet on an arrowhead and drop it back onto the sand as we walk on into the October night. And then one last one that I thought of that I singled out in connection with this reading. I might find more, but these are these are all uh, united by a certain theme. This one is titled, The Watchers on the Hills Wring Their Hands in Anguish. The watchers on the hills wring their hands in anguish. It begins in the spring, when white elk bones protrude from the soil. It begins when dreams lurking behind wallpaper sing out their pleas for a quarter here, a dollar there, anything to get them through the famine to follow the next war. The watchers wring their hands as they recall the time when they walked among the pines and the cedars in troops, leisurely as the frag fragrance rising from broken rowboats stacked on the banks of rivers, descending from they forget the exact place, but it was far and high. The fragrance la rises leisurely as the giraffe, wearing the necklace of emeralds of dubious authenticity, finds its footing on that thin wire that stretches between credulity and faith, over the deepening abyss of certainty where black ships sail where fishermen throw out their jewels, where doves dwell under arches, crumbling arches, through which armies passed during the last war, leaving behind smoke and desolation and starving children 
and women who wander alone about the yellow plain where black shapes sit out the long empty day. A splendid door of black polished wood and brass fittings on which is tacked a child's crayon drawing of his parents hangs above the far hills against turbulent clouds white as a fish belly. It is a rumor of the coming circus, of the gypsy trapeze artist and the bearded woman, of the opening of gates to deeper secrets, though there are deeper still, deep within red rock cliffs above the plain where the women wander. Up from a well they rise on slips of notepad paper, agonizing decisions made by bears in the throes of hibernation, beavers that raise pendants red, yellow, white, and black over their dams beneath the freeways, images of buttons, pink and plastic, forgotten words of forgotten prophets, the secrets faithfully kept by the old women who stir the kettles, the secrets of the prophets who dwell with the bears, the red, yellow, white, and black pendants sewn into quilts to wrap about the old women. The old man sitting on the ground, leaning against a broken wall, he remembers when he stood before a wall of sandstone etching characters into the patina, letters of a language once known, a language of troops of players in a play once known. Before the darkness rose from the sea and spread across the beach, and then the village, and then the farms, and the forests, and mountains behind it. Thank you. My friends know me as Colin Douglas. That's pronounced with a long O. That's how my mother gave it to me. I was named for Colin Kelly, and I'm pretty sure that's how his name was pronounced. Colin Kelly was the first American hero of World War II, or one of the first. You might want to look up his story. It's a good one. My father was in the Navy at the time. Seems that a, a number of us were named for Colin Kelly after his story was told. I use the name, Col I use the middle initial, Colin B. Douglas, on here because I needed to uh, distinguish myself at the time when I started publishing uh, from a certain Colin Douglas who was uh, writing ribald novels at the time, uh, publishing ribald novels of a kind that I have not written and uh, he had co-opted the name, so I had to use the initial. That's, that's my name. I was born in 1944 and brought up in Western Washington, up uh, near at the gateway, you could say, to the San Juan Islands, uh, north of the Puget Sound. I'm an enrolled member of the Samish Indian Nation, I became a Latter-day Saint at the age of 16, served in the Brazilian mission from 1964 to 1966, served in military intelligence in the regular army and the Utah National Guard. That was mostly as a counterintelligence special agent. I attended the University of Washington as a journalism major Finally, received a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in American literature at Brigham Young University. My focus of interest was, was um, well, what I called Latter-day Saint literary criticism. I wrote my thesis on that. The American literature was really necessary in order to be able to focus on that interest. I uh, worked for 20 years in the curriculum department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, editing manuals and handbooks and all sorts of other things. I was editor and lead reporter for the Magna Utah Times newspaper for two years. 
with the former Linda Jean Wells, whom I married in 1969. I am the father of seven children. We've lived in Utah since 1971, and I list here some literary favorites. Latter-day Saint scripture, including the Bible, and the Bible is absolutely fundamental. Arturo Rambo and Andre Breton, also Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, Kenneth Rexroth, Gary Snyder, and uh, Philip, Philip La Mancha. Now, let me add to that that at the age of 15, when my family was living in very primitive circumstances, literally in a shack in the woods outside of our hometown, Anacortes, Washington, I had walked, I'm a little proud of this, I had walked five miles from our shack into the town library. I would do that through the summer, check out a few books and take them back to the woods to read, sitting on a log under the fir trees and the cedar trees. And I'd been prompted to take an interest in, uh, in art. So I went to the library on this particular day in the summer of July, I think, of, oh, what would it have been, 1960, 1959 even. It was just before my sophomore year of high school. And uh, I stumbled on a book called How to Understand and in, how, well, How to Understand Modern Art. That was the title at the time. How to Understand Modern Art. And I took that book and I started reading it as I walked back uh, through the rural and country roads back toward our shack in the woods. And I, 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 I just, a, a new world opened up to me, a world that I had never known existed. It was just wonderful. It was enchanting. I was overwhelmed by it and in particular what affected me was a chapter on fantastic art and surrealism and uh, the surrealists just uh, overwhelmed me and in order to explain these surrealist paintings the author used excerpts from the surrealist poet uh, André Breton, and also from the, from the illuminations of Artur Rambeau, neither of whom I'd ever heard of before. And reading Rambeau in particular, it was just like one adolescent subconscious mainlining into another adolescent subconscious. I've never recovered from that fully recovered, if, if recovered is the right word, but I have never, I've never shaken that influence. It has fascinated me all of my life. And uh, that was about a year before Latter-day Saint missionaries came to our house, and taught us the restored gospel, and I was a convert, and the convert, the conversion was profound and real and lasting. I've never had a faith crisis. I've never second-guessed my decision. I've never had reason to look back. And to never had, well, let's leave that metaphor, that trope for a bit. Never had reason to look back. I look back often on that, actually, to understand better what happened, but, but uh, I'm still a convert. I'm still a believer. And I think it was, I think it was um, providential that my introduction to art and poetry, literature, and particularly to Rambeau and the Surrealists, came before my my uh, conversion to the restored gospel. I shared my story once with a with a BYU English professor, and. Uh, he said, uh, you were not brought up in the church, were you? And I said, no, I was not. And he said, well, if you had been, 
they would have had all of that washed out of you long before you were 15. I think that may be true. Um, I think it's a uh, sad commentary. Um, I, these poems are rather strange to, I think, most people who are likely to read them, certainly in the Latter-day Saint community and even in the Latter-day Saint literary community. Um, but I hope, I hope that, uh, hope that somebody picks up on them. Um, I'm a former bishop. I think even an old Mormon bishop has a subconscious that needs to be explored. And uh, this is what I've chosen to do as a writer, as a poet, is to explore that. Well, my story. Uh, I've, also, I've also had it suggested to me that I might want to introduce these poems a bit to try to explain them and help uh, readers find access to them. Um, and I'm going to do that simply by way of reading the author's note that I, is at the back of uh, this volume of poems. Where I said most of my likely readers will find the poems in the first part of this collection approximately through outside the longhouse to be readily accessible, but those in the latter part of the book may seem puzzling and strange. Surrealistic, though I am not a surrealist. Neo-romanticist influenced by surrealism is closer to the mark, I think. If the reader finds a beauty in those poems, despite their seeming irrationality, and though it be a mysterious beauty, then I call them successful. My method for composing them has been an exercise of something like what Keats called negative capability, which I understand as a stepping back of the conscious controlling mind with its categories and preconceptions to allow the poem to emerge from somewhere else. It is similar to Mallarmé's method and also the surrealist as described by Wallace Fowley to give over all initiative to the words themselves. I suggest that they be approached as dreams. Every reader will have had the experience of waking with a dream that seems important and meaningful, though the full meaning might remain elusive. Some of the imagery in these poems, in fact, came from sleeping dreams. Most of them, however, are more like waking dreams. I view dreams as messages from a deeper part of our being, the unconscious, if you will, supplying insights to assist us in the conscious conduct of life. I entertain the possibility that such messages are revelatory in a certain sense, for they come from a place within us that, by God's grace, is uncorrupted by the fall. The unconscious always speaks the truth of its insights and evaluations about matters on which at the conscious level the natural man, as it is called in the Book of Mormon, is too willing to equivocate, rationalize, and deny. The I in the mortal conscious mind wants to cheat, but the unconscious is unfailingly honest. Whether messages from my unconscious are of value to anyone but me, the reader will decide, but my sense is that my life's tasks are not wholly unlike those of others, and I become more persuaded to the Jungian view that a common set of archetypal figures from a collective unconscious speaks in dreams to us all, because we share the human condition. What is spoken to one might be of value to another. As Joseph Campbell has put it, the myth is the public dream. The dream is the personal myth. And I would add that the public myth must begin in someone's personal myth. More can be said about the nature of these Oniric poems, which is what I prefer they be called. But to say it with anything approaching completeness requires far more philosophical and theological verbiage than space available here permits, and to condense it renders it even more cryptic than it is in fuller discourse. Nevertheless, I think I must say something, and it is the following. 
to my mind. Poems of this kind can be merest glimpses through a window on the infinite and eternal and marvelous and rationally, literally unspeakable mystery of being, of that which is spirit, even the spirit of truth, in the words of Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 93. Of the utter freedom, agency of being, of the erotic and convulsively beautiful ecstasy of eternal life and creation. <laughs>